Hello and welcome. In this video I'm buying a haul and I will make out of this a nice wall clock. So it all started with Justin Holm in uh, Leicester. Thank you Justin, I love your uh, sawmill facility and you have so much stock to pick from. It's a great location. For me it's like a playground. Love it. So I managed to buy a nice piece, as you can see, with a huge hole of cracking yo. Additionally, I bought this lovely piece of uh, cedar wood that will be another end grain project for the future. And additionally, I grabbed a piece of uh, oak with, again, quite a few holes. So, welcome to Whitetail Creative Design. As you can see, we have a really nice uh, piece of uh, yo. It's cracking, you can see all the little pieces are falling apart. So in the grand scheme, I thought it would be almost like a scrap piece of timber, but then I thought, nah, it has so many features that it would be a shame to throw it away and not make a nice one-off item out of it. So uh, it took me a few weeks just to decide how to approach it. Uh, it was just crumbling anytime I tried to move it or uh, touch it, it was just crumbling and falling into even smaller pieces. So my fear was that it will end up in bits before I have a chance to actually do something with it. So uh, I started with vacuum cleaner just to hover up uh, all the dust and little particles, try to save the bigger pieces. So I'm planning to uh, use resin and attach them back to have even more features and less resin, more timber. At least that was the plan. And uh, it took me a little bit just to clean it up. Each time I tried to spin it around, even more uh, little bits were crumbling and falling out of the piece. So uh, it took me a little bit of time uh, to clean it up. I used the chisel uh, to take uh, biggest parts of the bark and another really loose imperfections and try to clean it up as good as I could. It was a time consuming process, but it was a fun part and I enjoyed this a lot. I like to use the wire brush attachment uh, to the uh, power drill. It takes away most of the loose stuff. In the top right corner, you can see uh, I had a small go and I was thinking to make a round clock, something more traditional, and I was just mapping out how to trim the piece to make it more round and a little bit smaller, more manageable. So that was my idea at some point. And to be fair, I'm quite happy that I abandoned it later on. At this stage, uh, I'm trying to prepare little cookies uh, to fill up the void. Uh, I like resin, but I like when there is a little bit of resin and more timber. So uh, I managed to grab some old branches <clears throat> that they were drying out uh, in my shed for a while and use them. Unfortunately, as you can see, there are quite a few uh, imperfections, little uh, woodworm holes uh, in the pieces, but in the grand scheme, it didn't matter. Uh, I, won't, I will fill them up uh, with resin later on. So uh, I did cut quite a few uh, pieces and had a go with fitting them and just having a go how they will look like. I'm using this old school uh, bandsaw, but I find it more and more useful. I use it more frequently than I originally imagined. Of course, I need to strip uh, the bark. Probably I should have done this when I brought the piece uh, to the shed earlier. It might be easier to do it. But hey ho, it is what it is. So I had to strip it uh, and I was going to cut this little thicker branch because I thought I will just use a few thicker pieces just to fill up the void. Unfortunately, uh, I think the branch was slightly too thick and the cookies were too big uh, for the opening that I had. I'm using coke uh, to seal up the bottom of the slab. This word just makes me cringe coke. It just always sounds dodgy. Anyway, uh, I'm using uh, old hardwood uh, board 
covered in sellotape and then waxed to prevent any stickiness of resin to it. And hopefully the coke will seal it sufficiently to avoid any seepage and escape of the resin during the pour. As you can see, even in the background, there are little, little particles of uh, timber. Uh, it's just crumbling all the time. Anytime I try to spin it around, uh, little bits are falling off. So uh, hopefully I will make half decent job and I will not spill too much resin in the process. We'll see. Learn from my previous misfortune with mixing the wrong ratio of resin and hardener, I'm paying triple attention to have the correct ratio to mix as manufacturer's guidance. On that occasion, uh, I will be sealing uh, the edge uh, to prevent uh, bubbles to create. However, the primary goal of this exercise was actually not to seal, uh, but it is to stabilize all the little uh, bits of timber so that they will not crumble and they will be more secure and locked in place. So that was uh, the main actually goal of uh, pouring this thin translucent layer of resin just to hold all the bits in place. Now I'm uh, trying to play with the layout, how to uh, fit all the little cookies and cutoffs of the branch to uh, fill up the void. Again, mixing the ratio, as per manufacturer's instruction, I'm using Glasscast 50 for deep pour. I will be using this product for uh, at least two layers to gain that 50 odd uh, millimeters of thickness needed to cover the whole depth of the hole. Uh, as you can see, there is a little bit of resin outside. Uh, it was not a huge disaster, just a small spill. So in the grand scheme, happy days. I wanted to use black resin. However, I wanted to add a pigment of gold and salmon gold or whatever it's called, another goldy shade. And it's quite interesting that all the flakes uh, just went all the way down. And at the very bottom, you can see uh, a nice layer of uh, little sparkling uh, flakes of gold. And now at the top you can see a layer of shiny flakes of metal or uh, gold. I'm a little bit disappointed that the main volume of the resin is not having as many uh, as I expected. I was quite generous with adding uh, the gold flakes, but this seems to be a little bit in the background. Now is the messy part. Uh, I hate using router without dust extraction, but when I'm using sled, there is no option how to attach it. So you can see plenty of dust and it's just a, not, not a nice uh, place to be. I'm using the Hoover to Hoover up as, as much as I can as I go. I'm using, of course, the dust mask, but it's not the best and most fun. So uh, it's just unpleasant. Having said that, Using the router sled is really efficient and quite cheap way of flattening the slab. It took me probably longer actually to uh, assemble the aluminum extruded frame uh, to support the sled than actually to flatten the slab. So in the grand scheme, it's a fairly good way and fairly cheap way of flattening the slab at home. So that is the uh, final piece after using the router. Uh, as you can see, there are still small marks uh, when the router bit was going left and right, uh, but nothing that the belt sander cannot deal with. So it's pretty good and I'm overall happy with the outcome at this stage. So it's time uh, to become a dentist and play with the little tools, dental tools to extract little dust out of the woodworm uh, holes. It took me a couple of minutes just to go through all the holes and prepare them uh, for the resin to saturate them and fill up the voids at the next stage. I got this dental uh, pick kit from Amazon. I think it was about five, six quid. 
uh, it's not amazing quality. You can see the tip uh, has already bent without applying too much force, but it's doing the job, so can't complain about it. Now it's time to uh, seal the bottom uh, because the timber is still well cracked and I want to ensure that there will be no further seepage and escape of the resin. So I seal up what I think is all the voids going through just to make sure that it is all nice and secure. It is the first time that I'm using aluminum tape and I'm really pleased with the effect. It's uh, quite efficient. Uh, probably it's a little bit more tricky actually to peel it off in comparison to cello tape. So now I'm inspecting if I cover all the holes. In the meantime, in the UK, the temperature dropped to two degrees uh, in the morning. Hence, I moved the slab uh, in-house uh, so that there is more consistent temperature. And I'm playing with the syringe, filling up little voids. It took me probably 20, 30 minutes uh, to fill them up. Of course, I had to uh, top up on few occasions when the resin penetrate through the holes all the way. But it was a really nice and easy process. A couple of hours later, <coughs> I had a little inspection just to check the level of the resin and it was all good. I started to use the uh, button gas uh, instead of the heat gun. Definitely the blowtorch is way more efficient when it comes to popping up all the little bubbles than the heat gun. So from now on, I'm just using the blowtorch. It's a way nicer and better tool to use. I tried uh, to scrape off uh, the excess of the resin uh, by heating up with the blowtorch, uh, with the heat gun, and then uh, using the chisel, but it was just not working properly and somehow it was just cumbersome. So I just thought, let's move on to the belt sander. And to be fair, the belt sander, except creating lots of dust, was really good tool to use. It was really efficient and I used grid 80 uh, and then I moved on to grid 120 and I'm really pleased with the outcome. And it was in the grand scheme quite quick. The belt got blocked on few occasions. I had to swap the belt once or twice. Uh, the resin is usually blocking this one. Now I'm just uh, marking up where to cut uh, the edge that I made uh, and I wasn't really happy with. So now I just mark up where and how I would like to use uh, to cut it off. And I'm using uh, the bandsaw Probably I could improve on the support of the piece. It's maybe not the best one. Uh, the table could be slightly bigger to support the piece more firmly. But in the grand scheme, I was able to manage this and I was happy uh, to do it by hand. And again, uh, I'm starting to like more and more my band. So it's just such a useful uh, tool. Once the piece was uh, trimmed on the band, so I moved again to the belt sander uh, to smooth it off and just take any excess and any imperfections done by band. So again, a couple of minutes of uh, playing with the belt sander did the trick and I was quite happy with the outcome. Now uh, going to the uh, final sanding stage, uh, my intention was to stick with 120-180 grit as required by Rubio Monaco to get a good penetration uh, when it comes to oiling part. However, there were so many cracks and voids uh, that I filled up with resin that it was really hard to uh, make a distinction between the resin part and the timber part. Now I'm using the CA glue with activator uh, to fill up little tiny imperfections. And another lesson. I was probably too generous with uh, activator and you can see those little uh, foam up bubbles of glue. So the lesson is use less activator. And thank you, Ian, for the tip. I will remember it and I will use less activator. I think it took me uh, three goals at filling up the little holes because each time I use the sandpaper to smooth it off, new uh, voice, new bubbles uh, came up that I had to fill up. So now I was just playing with the layout, how to uh, mark up uh, 9, 12, 3 and 6 uh, for the clock. And I would love to have probably a Rockler um, 
press drill, portable per, uh, press drill, instead of using this uh, piece of uh, metal for the drilling. It's still good. I like it. That's the best one I can have uh, at the minute, but that's the one that probably I would upgrade in the future. I'm using a 10 mil drill. I know that the shaft for the clock is 9 mil, so it will give me one millimeter of the clearance, so it should be fairly easy to fit it later on. It is the first time uh, that I will be using the uh, masking tape with CA glue to attach little pieces of 6 mm uh, hardwood ply boards uh, to make a jig for the router. Later on, when I tried to peel it off, it actually was quite easy and it did the job. So I'm quite happy. That's the little upgrade, how I operate in terms of the setting up a simple jig for the router. It was really easy to attach and it was really easy to peel off. I'm using quarter inch shank bits for the router, which can normally accommodate half inch shank. And again, I started without dust extraction uh, to be able to see better what I'm doing. The downside is of course the amount of dust and mess created in the workshop. Now I have plugged in my uh, dust extraction, so it just improved a lot uh, collection of the dust. However, the downside is that I cannot really see uh, what I'm doing. So I had to check uh, frequently the progress and observe if I'm not making any mistakes on the go. And so far, happy days. Unfortunately, a few seconds later, when I had another go at the next pass, you can see all good with the router bit. And now, can you spot what's happening? All good, all good, all good. And now you can see little sparks flying. And then if you miss them, in the top left corner, you can see little sparks. And now we should be able to see them again. That is the downside now of using the dust extraction because it blocks and I cannot really see what is going on. And what has happened? Have a look. Let's spin it around. And the little bearing just collapsed and disappeared entirely. If I would be not using the dust extraction, probably I would be able to spot it earlier and luckily on that occasion, no damage, nothing really happened. Now I'm just checking the minimal thickness needed for the shaft of the clock. Uh, I think the spec said between 9 and 13 mil. I left 11, so it should be good to go. Then I thought that it would be nice to round off the edge so that it will be easier uh, to change the battery every 9-12 months. Hence, I thought the little chamfer edge, I think I'm using the quarter inch, no, half an inch uh, radius bit uh, to round it off. Uh, I think I just went slightly too deep and you can see that little, little line around it, but nothing that the sandpaper cannot fix. And the final outcome was that the edge was really nice and smooth. Now I'm marking up where I would like to position uh, holes uh, for the main rope uh, to hang it. The whole piece is fairly heavy and I didn't fancy to hang it in the middle like a picture frame. And I thought I would just go with the rope and attach it at both ends. And that way it will be easier to make it level and a uh, little bit easier to hang it. I thought I would be able to use my uh, cordless drill. Unfortunately, it was not man enough and not powerful enough to do it. Uh, hence, I had to switch to my corded Bosch power drill. And I have to say that I love those Argo Auger uh, bits. It's just going through like a butter. Uh, you almost have to hold the drill uh, to make sure that it will not go uh, too deep. It's really, really nice uh, design. So uh, 13 or six, no, 16 uh, mil uh, hole. And it just took a couple of seconds to go through the slab. Again, second hole on the other side. And a couple of seconds later, Job done. 
The idea was to mark up 9, 6, 3 and 12 uh, with uh, bold heads and I thought it would be just a little bit different design than the standard clock face. So I went to the local screw fix and got those uh, M16 bolts and I thought foolishly that I can <laughs> cut them by hand. I think I went through three blades. Yes, I should have vice uh, properly locked into the workbench, but uh, I didn't have a space to do it on that occasion. And my little helper came over and we used angle grinder and it took five seconds <laughs> probably to cut each one why I didn't thought about it earlier. Anyway, uh, now I'm using the marking uh, masking tape uh, to mark up uh, where and how to make a cutout uh, for the bolt head. The idea is that the uh, head of the bolt will stick out by just a couple of millimeters so that it will be uh, proud out of the surface of the wall clock. My biggest concern was uh, the close proximity to the timber edge Hence, uh, I used the power drill with, I think, 3 mil drill uh, to take as much uh, of the timber out before I was using chisel to cut out the exact shape for the bolt head. And overall, it was my first go at using chisel for that application. I was a little bit nervous how it will go, especially uh, on the interface between timber, resin, and you can see that there are a few different uh, orientations of the timber. So I was really close to the edge and I was a little bit nervous about this one, but in the grand scheme, it went okay. And I have to say that I do like the idea of using the masking tape to mark it. It makes life so much easier. You can uh, better see the exact shape you have to cut out. So uh, that was my first one. Uh, probably could have been slightly better aligned, but I think as a first go, I'm pretty pleased uh, with the outcome. And of course, a little bit of a hammer always helps. I'm using uh, Ruby Monocode uh, on that application, uh, following, of course, the manufacturer's instruction. Uh, however, the whole timber has been, or most of the timber has been sanded to slightly higher grit, hence the Ruby Monocode did not penetrate as good as if it would be sanded just to 120, 150 grit. After about 24 hours, I gently sanded off the first layer of the Rubio Mono coat, and then I have applied a second coat. That way, I managed to bump up the sheen and the details a little bit more, just to highlight all the little grain features and the structure. So I'm really pleased with the final outcome. It's really satisfying to see all the timber slash resin effects pop up and it's really nice to watch those little details. On purpose, I have left uh, all the rough surfaces unfinished to create even bigger contrast between nicely sanded and polished uh, elements of the resin and timber versus the slightly darker, more gray areas of the slab. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. If you did, I would really appreciate if you could subscribe. That would help me a lot. Thank you again for watching. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time.